Anything moves like that. They. They the cro- No! No, no! The 
those fuckers had something. And it broke out. It doesn't make sense. An outbreak couldn't have destroyed the ship. We had to try and re-establish containment. They blew it up. You said the destruct. We didn't have a choice. It spread remarkably fast.
Uh, that was pretty, pretty amazing. I really liked that. And for those who didn't stay till after the credits. I really liked that little touch of comedy at the end. <laughs> the guy, Mills trying to go back to sleep. Um, all right, there's a couple of things I really, really enjoyed about that um, whole clip. Uh, I liked the coming up on the planet, um, the the first glance at the Borrowdale, and it exploding with the um, craft jet jettisoning off into space. The CG was great, the explosions were good, it was very well balanced, and I also liked the fact that they kept the monster hidden. People always complain about um, the alien being visible, all the special effects being used, making the alien look fake, and they completely avoided that by just hinting at it, uh, which I think is really, really effective. So I think they should be really, really proud of that short. Um, yeah, it was really good. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Uh, so yeah, um, what does everyone else think about, um, about the film, I guess? Any feedback at all? Because I would like to know what your thoughts are in regards to, um, that film. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I am just going to, I don't know whether my chat's not working or what. But I'm just going to have to go into chat externally. no idea why my chat's not working but that's okay it's all good so I'm just gonna do the continuation of reading the script for Alien now uh, for those who don't know I've been reading the original story by Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Shusett screenplay and we read up to page 10 last time but now this time, I'm going to be continuing on. And there's lots of pages to this, so we'll be doing this for a while. Well past Alien Day, I think. <laughs> Just kidding. There's about 93 pages, so there's like probably about nine times that I'll be reading this. And then, and then we'll be done, and then we can talk about the script. So I'll, I'll just recount on page 10. So those people playing at home... You can get the link to the original Alien script uh, from the AVP Galaxy Downloads section, which I can post into the blog. Uh, so last time we were reading, <coughs> we were on the interior bridge, uh, and the men are strapping in, but this time it is with grim determination. So for those who aren't aware, in the original Alien script all of the characters were written as men but they were interchangeable to women characters but they were written as men and everyone's names were different so this may be a bit hard for you to follow if you're not familiar with the names. so i'm just going to go through the names again so uh, chaz standard is captain dallas martin roby is ellen ripley uh, Del Brassard is actually Lambert. Sandy Melconis, uh, the communications tech, is actually Kane. 
uh, Cleve Hunter uh, is actually um, Parker, and Jay Faust is actually Brett. So there's no Ash. Uh, there is Jonesy, which we found out <laughs> in one of the pages. Uh, but now we're going to go on to um, page 11. So. They're just identifying the planet and they're looking at the cloud layers. And now this is page 11. Exterior, snark, outer space. The great dish antenna on the start, snark, sorry. I'm just making up words now. I'm going to start the reading again. The great dish antenna on the snark folds down against the main body of the ship and other parts flatten out until the ship has assumed its aerodynamic form. Interior bridge, standard. Dell, set a course and bring us in on that beam. Exterior, space. The snark's engines cough into life and send it drifting toward the distant dot that is the planetoid. The camera approaches the planetoid until it looms large on the screen. It is turbulent, completely enveloped in dun colored clouds. I have no idea what that means. The snark drops down toward the surface. So those who are only just following from this video, the snark is actually the Nostromo, but that was the original name before they changed it. Interior bridge, standard. Activate lifter quads, brassard. Activated, vertical drop checked. Correcting course, on tangential course now, orbiting. There is a brief pause as he studies his instruments. Crossing the terminator, entering night side. Exterior of the snark in orbit. Beneath the orbiting snark, night's curtain rolls across the planet. Descending at an angle, the snark drops down into the thick atmosphere of the planetoid. Interior bridge, ropey. Atmospheric turbulence, dust storm. Standard says, turn on navigation lights. Exterior of the snark. Hydroplaning down through the pea soup atmosphere. A set of brilliant lights switches on, cutting through the dust, but hardly improving visibility. Interior bridge. Brassard says, approaching point of origin, closing at 20 kilometers, 15 and slowing, 10, 5. Gentlemen, we are directly above the source of the transmission. Standard says, what's the terrain down there? Side replies, well, line of sight is impossible due to dust. Radar gives me noise. Sonar gives me noise. Infrared? Noise. Let's try ultraviolet. There, flat, totally flat, a plane. Standard replies, is it solid? Brassard replies, it's basalt, rock. Standard replies, then take it down. Brassard says, drop begins now, 15 kilometers dropping, 12, 10, 8, and slowing. 5, 3, 2, 1 kilometer and slowing. Lock tractor beams. There is a loud electrical hum and the ship shudders. Roby says locked. Now we're on to page 13. Brassard says, kill the drive engines, and the engines fall silent. Roby says, engines off. Brassard says, 900 meters and dropping, 800, 700. Hang on, gentlemen. Exterior, surface of planet, night. 
The night shrouded surface is a hell of a blowing dust. The snark hovers above it on a glowing beam of light dropping down slowly. Landing struts unfold like insect legs. The interior of the bridge, the side says, and we're down. Exterior surface of the planet, night. The ship touches down heavily. It rocks on a huge shock. It, it rocks on huge shock absorbers. Interior bridge. The whole ship vibrates violently for an instant. Then all the panels in the room flash simultaneously and the lights go out. Brassard says, Jesus Christ. And the lights come on again. Standard says, what the hell happened? Roby hits a switch. Engine room, what happened? So just taking a pause for a sec. So in here, uh, this is obviously when the Nostromo lands on LV-426 and Ripley is now uh, radioing to Parker and Brett who are in the engineering room. So this is page 14 now. Fast saves over a filtered com. Just a minute, hold it, I'm checking. Roby says, has the hull been breached? Brassard replies, uh, and scans his gorges. No, I don't see anything. We've still got pressure. There is a beep from the communicator, and then fast over filtered radio. Martin, this is Jay. The intakes are clogged with dust. We're overheated and burned out a whole cell. Standard replies, strikes his plan panel. Damn it, how long to fix? Roby speaks into the microphone. How long to fix? Fast, replying over the comms. Hard to say. Roby then says, well, get started. Fast replies over the comm. Right. Talk to you. Standard says, let's take a look outside. Turn the screens back on. Malconis hits a few buttons and the screens flicker, but remain black. Prasad says, can't see a blessed thing. <laughs> you can tell where they changed that. Um, exterior ship, night. Only a few glittering lights distinguish the ship from absolute darkness around it. The wind moans and screams. Dust blows in front of the tiny glimmering lights. Interior, bridge, night. Standard. Kick on the floods. Exterior ship, night. A ring of floodlights on the ship come to life, pouring blinding light out into the night. They illuminate nothing but a patch of featureless grey cloud. Sorry. A patch of featureless grey ground and clouds of blowing dust. The wind shrieks. Interior, bridge of night. Roby says, not much help. Standard stares at the dark screens and says, well, we can't go anywhere in this darkness. How long till dawn? Malconis replies while consulting his instruments. Well, this rock rotates every two hours. The sun should be coming up in about 20 minutes. I'm just going to stop there for a sec. Uh, just to let you followers know, uh, last time we were discussing this, Dan O'Bannon made the planet only 120 kilometers in diameter. So that's very tiny. So that's why that has a very short day and night. All right, continuing. Brassard says, good, maybe we'll be able to see something then. Roby replies, or something will be able to see us. Ooh. All right, this is page 16. They all look at him. The screen dissolves to the exterior ship, night, and the main title sequence. The 
floodlights on the snark fight a losing battle against the darkness and the storm. Main theme music begins. Extremely ominous. <laughs> the title appears. Alien. The titles run. Gradually the screen begins to lighten as the sun rises. The silhouette of the snark becomes visible. Like some strange insect crouching motionless on the barren plain. The floods shut off. Dense clouds of impenetrable dust shriek and moan, obscuring everything and reducing the sunlight to a dull orange. End main titles. Interior, bridge, day. Close on a screen. It shows nothing but swirling clouds of orange dust. So I'm just going to pause there. In the concept art uh, done by Ron Cobb, you can see that the initial designs of the planet were done in a very 70s sort of style in regards to alien planets. So it's like orange clouds and it's very, very bright looking, very different compared to what we ended up getting in Alien the movie. So this script will be referring to the original concept art uh, in this case. All right, continuing. Pull back from screen. The men, Standard, Roby, Brassard, and Malconis, are sitting and standing around the room, drinking coffee and staring at the screens, which reveal only billowing dust. Roby says, There could be a whole city out there and we'd never see it. Brassard says, Not sitting on our butts in here, that's for sure. Standard replies, just settle down. Sandy, you get any response yet? For those playing at home, we're now on to page 17. Malconis pulls off his earphones. Sorry, nothing. But that damn transmission every 32 seconds. I've tried every frequency on the spectrum. Brassard says, are we just going to sit around and wait for an invitation? Mm, they used that bit in Prometheus. Um, Roby gives Brassard a black look and then stabs a button on his console and speaks into the mic. Roby into mic. Hello, Faust. Faust replies over the comms. Yeah? Roby says to Faust, how's it coming on the engines? So this is the part where Ripley is talking to um, Brett and Parker. Interior, engine room. Faust is seated at an electronic workbench, brightly lit, speaking into a wall in intercom. Faust says, I never saw anything as fine as this dust. These cells are pitted on a microscopic level. I have to polish these things smooth again. So it's going to take a while, okay? Interior, bridge, day. Roby replies, yeah, okay. And puts down the mic. <laughs> I just noticed it's less of an interaction between Roby and Faust versus Ripley and Parker. Um, I think it loses some of the characterization there. So it's really good that it ended up changing in the script. All right, continuing. Standard says, Sandy, how far are we from the source of that transmission? Malconis replies, the source of transmission is to the northeast, about 300 meters. Roby replies, close. Brassard says, Close enough to walk to. Standard replies. Martin, will you run me an atmospheric? Roby punches buttons and consults his panels. 10% argon, 85% nitrogen, 5% neon, and some trace elements. Standard says. Non-toxic but unbreathable. Pressure? Roby replies. 10 to the 4th dynes per square meter, sorry, per square centimeter. Standard says, good, moisture content? 
Roby says. Zero. Dry as a bone. Standard replies. Any microorganisms? Roby says. Not a one. It's dead. Standard says, anything else? And Roby replies, yeah, rock particles, dust. Standard says, well, we won't need any... <laughs> well, we won't need pressure suits, but breathing masks are called for. Sandy, can you rig up some kind of portable unit that we can use to follow that transmission to its source? Mel Melconis replies, no problem. So... I just want to pause that for a sec. It's really interesting how they've described LV-426 as completely dead with no moisture. Um, and and then they can actually come out of the ship without suits because that's pretty much what happened in Covenant, except, you know, the air was actually breathable. So... It's interesting that that's what they did in the original Alien script. That's all I'm, I'm saying. All right, continuing. So we're coming up to page 20 really quick. So I might continue. We'll, we'll see how we go, okay? Uh, Brassard says, I volunteer for the exploration party. And Standard replies, I heard you. You want to break out the sidearms? Interior, main, arm lock, day. Standard, Brassard, and Melconis enter the lock. They all wear gloves, boots, jackets, and pistols. Brassard touches a button in the interior door slide silently shut, sealing them into the lock. They all pull on rubbly, <laughs> rubbery full head oxygen masks. I'm just going to pause that for a sec. So, the... I think these oxygen masks look a lot like the sorts of masks that um, aviation pilots use in like military jets because that's kind of the inspiration of the space jockey so it's really interesting contrast if they had kept that and then they found the space jockey because then it would totally feel like the space jockey was just wearing a suit yeah anyway um, so, continuing on. Standard, adjusting the radio on his mask. I'm sending, do you hear me? Brassard says, receiving. Malconis says, receiving. Standard says, alright, now just remember, keep away from those weapons unless I say otherwise. Martin, do you read me? Interior bridge day, Roby. Read you, Chaz. Interior main airlock today. Standard. Open the outer door. Ponderously, the outer, the outer lock door slides open. Orange sunlight streams into the lock. The clouds of dust swirl in. We hear the moaning of the wind outside. A mobile stairway slides out of the open hatchway and clunks as it hits the ground. Standard walks out into the storm, followed by the others. So this is page 20, by the way. Uh, exterior planetoid day. The three men chop down to the gangplank, to the surface of the planet. Their feet sink into a thick layer of dust and loose rock. The men huddle together, looking around. The wind screams and tugs at their clothes, but nothing can be seen. Standard says, Which way, Sandy? Malconis is fiddling with a portable direction finder. Malconis points, That way. Standard says, You lead. Malconis walks into the binding, sorry, the blinding dust clouds, followed by, followed closely by the others. Standard says, Okay, Martin, we're on our way. Interior bridge day. Roby is the sole occupant of the bridge. He is huddled over his console, smoking a cigarette and watching three moving blips on a screen. I just want to pause this for a sec. That's pretty much 
what plays out in Prometheus as well. You've got Yannick on the bridge of the ship and he's smoking his cigar, uh, but he's not the sole person there. Obviously, there's other, um, other ship staff around him. Uh, but it's interesting that he's watching the blips on the screen and that's exactly what uh, Yannick does in Prometheus as well. All right, continuing. Okay, Chaz, I hear you. I've got you on my board, Standard says over the filtered comms. Good, I'm getting you clear too. Let's just keep the line open. All right, that was page 20, but I feel like I can keep going because I'm, I'm kind of enjoying this. <laughs> so we'll, we'll keep going. <clears throat> page 21. Exterior, planetoid, day. Three men plow their way through a limbo of yellow dust and shrieking wind. With their rubbery masks and deliberate movements, they look like deep sea divers at the bottom of the murky ocean. They just want to stop there. Maybe that was the inspiration for the suits um, in Alien then, because they, they do look like deep sea divers with their uh, full helmets. Anyway, continuing. Malconis leads the column, following the compass on the direction finder. Standard continues. Can't see more than three meters in any direction out here. We're walking blind on instruments. They wade on, following Malconis. Abruptly, he halts. Standard says, What's wrong? Malconis says, My signal's fading. He studies the direction finder. Interior, bridge, day. Roby is listening intensely to the dialogue from the helmet radios. So now they're wearing helmets or are they wearing face masks? There's in inconsistency in the script. <laughs> All right. Um, Melconis says over the filtered comms, it's the dust, it's interfering. His concentration is so great that he does not notice Hunter coming up behind him. Over filtered uh, comms. Hold it. I've got it again. It's over that way. Standing directly behind Roby, Hunter speaks. What's happening? Startled out of his wits, Roby gasps and whirls around to face Hunter. <laughs> Roby, st Roby startled silly. How? Hunter stares at Roby, whose momentary terror dissolves into embarrassed anger. Just want to stop there for a sec. They they directly play out that that scene in in Prometheus when um, Melbourne and Fifield are lost in the pyramid, and Yannick is uh, checking on them uh, because their their comms wasn't working and um, what wasn't working or like they were radio silent for a while and and he says something and it startles them so yeah i really like how they've they've used that and kind of turned it on its head in the prometheus script it's a good jump scare it's the classic <laughs> um exterior planetoid day uh continuing the three men push their way through the storm Malconis stops again and studies the direction finder it's close Real close. How far? We should almost be on top of it. I just can't quite. Suddenly, Brassard grabs Standard's arms. Standard's arm and points. The others stare in the direction he's pointing. Reverse angle, their point of view. Through the dense clouds of swirling dust, we can just barely make out some sort of, some kind of huge shape. As we watch, the dust clears slightly, revealing a grotesque ship rising from the sand like some gigantic toadstool. It is clearly of non-human manufacture. The camera angles on the men. They are struck dumb by the sight of the craft. Finally, Standard finds his voice. Martin, uh, we have found it. 
Roby replies sharply over the filtered comms. Found what? So now we're going to page 23. Standard says, It appears to be some sort of spacecraft. We're going to approach it. They start toward the alien ship. Interior bridge day. Standard continues over the filter comms. There are no signs of life, no lights, no movement. Roby and Hunter are listening with hypnotic concentration. Standard continues over the filtered comms. We're uh, approaching the base. Exterior base of Toadstool Ship Day. A strangely shaped door yawns open at the base of the ship. Dust and sand has blown in, filling the lower part of the entrance. With great caution, the men approach the entrance and the group around it. So just want to pause there for a sec and we'll talk about the design of the derelict. So as you can hear in this, it sounds like the derelict is actually a mushroom <laughs> because they haven't gotten HR Geiger on board yet. So I, I think that's kind of interesting because of the way uh, mushrooms are portrayed in Alien Covenant being really alien. Um, oh, by the way, uh, hello, Luna Otaku. <laughs> or should I say Cooper? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's really interesting, uh, the space jockey uh, as well. But we'll, we'll get to that soon. So uh, I like how they've, they're entering the lower part of the ship. And I guess in Covenant, it was shown... Uh, that nature has kind of entered into the ship and taken over because the base was open already so it let in a lot of dirt and you've got the waterfall and, and the rocks and the the moss and um, the, the spores so yeah it's really interesting so <clears throat> anyway we'll continue now so uh, with great caution the men approach the entrance and group around it standard continues appears to be a door hanging open. The entrance is clogged with debris. Rassad says, looks like a derelict. Standard says, Martin, we're going in. I'm going to hold the conversation to a minimum from here on. Interior alien ship day. The doorway is a glowing geometric blur of light against the blackness, spewing dust. In the darkness of the chamber, sorry, in the darkness of the chamber are huge formless shapes. Standard, Brassard and Malconis appear silhouetted against the doorway. They switch on a flashlight-like device called data sticks and step in. So there's actually an image of a data stick provided. <laughs> um, I don't know whether it was... Dan O'Bannon that drew it, or Ronald Chissette, or uh, Ron Cobb, but I'll just show the picture here. I can't see what I'm showing you because I've got the camera in front of me. Where is it? Okay. Yeah, so that's the data stick. Do, 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 do. Data stick. Okay. All right, that's enough. <laughs> Go to the next page. Um, just just to bring up a point with the data sticks, they kind of have something like that in Prometheus as well. Uh, David, Shaw, Holloway are all carrying something like a torchlight with a little, it looks like there's a little laptop attached to it. And I think that was their version of the data stick. So it's really interesting how they kind of reuse that sort of um, concept again in Prometheus. So carefully peering around, they pick their way past the distinct machinery. Malcona says, airlock? Standard says, who knows? Rassad says, let's try and find the control room. As they move their lights around, they can see that the walls, ceiling and machinery are full of huge irregular holes. Malcona says, 
Look at these holes. This place looks like Swiss cheese. Brassard shines his light up into the huge hole in the ceiling. This hole goes up several decks. Looks like somebody was firing a military disintegrator in here. They all peer up the hole into the darkness. Standard says, climbing gear. Standard draws out a stubby spear gun with a grappling attached to it. Ah, so this is the spear gun that they end up killing the alien with at the end. Interesting. And it's also interesting that they talk about this because they're using this climbing gear and uh, Daniel's was a rock climber in Alien Covenant. I don't know whether that's in <laughs> that's uh, intentional, but I, I like it. Um, people said that oh, it doesn't make sense why Daniels would be a rock climber. Well, maybe this was a homage to Dan O'Bannon's original script and using the grappling hook. Anyway, <laughs> uh, going back to the script. Uh, the grappler is launched up into the darkness, trailing a thin wire. There is a dull clunk, and the wire dangles. I'll go first, Brassard says. Standard goes, no, you'll follow me. Standard attaches the wire to the powered gearbox in the chest and presses the button. With a mechanical whine, he is pulled up into the hole, using his feet for leverage, where he can. I just want to pause it there. Um, because they are going up into a hole as opposed to going down into a, a cavern where the space jockey is in um, Alien. So like we got to remember like this is the original scripts. They're inside the derelict and they're going upwards now as opposed to down. So there's like little changes like that. Um, so page 25. Brassard attaches the wire to his chest unit. This chamber is totally dark as Brassard arrives at the top of the hole. Standard stands with his flashlight camera in brackets data stick, tracing a beam through the hanging dust. Brassard unclips himself from the climbing wire, then raises his own light. At that moment, Melconis arrives at the top of the hole. Their lights scan the room. The beams are clearly visible as columns of light in the floating dust. They reveal heavy, odd shapes. Brassard stumbles over something. He shines his light down on it. It is a large, glossy urn, brown in colour, with a peculiar marking. With peculiar markings. Brassard stands it upright. It has a round opening on the top and it is empty. I just want to pause it there. So if you are familiar with that scene in Alien Covenant when you're in, or when you, you see in David's lab, uh, you see this like vase open urn with the no lid. That's what they're referring to in the original Alien scripts. This urn that uh, Brassard discovers in um, the alien derelict ship and and this was pre pre overmorph uh pre uh, alien cycle so this is the original concept that dan and bannon came up with and they used it in prometheus which i totally love um so yeah <laughs> i just want to say that because so many people go oh i don't like it. prometheus and covenant blah 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 it's not alien. It's like, well, it actually is. It's, it's more alien than alien was. <laughs> anyway. So, continuing. Suddenly, Malconis lets out a grunt of shock. Their lights have illuminated something unspeakably grotesque. A huge alien skeleton seated in the control chair. By the way, this is the space jockey. I'm um, pausing again. So the space jockey is not a big giant elephantine structure in the original script it's a skeleton just sitting in something which is like an open coffin so yeah anyway continuing 
They approach the skeleton, their lights trained on it. It is a grotesque thing, bearing no resemblance to the human form. Malconis says, Holy Christ! Standard shines his light on the console, at which the hideous skeleton is seated. He moves his light closer and peers at the plant panel. Standard says, Look at this! And they approach. Standard continues, Something has been scratched here, into the veneer. See? I'm really excited about this part. <laughs> Traced raggedly onto the surface of the panel, as by the point of a sharp instrument, is a small triangle. I'm just going to show you this on the script. The triangle just there. Hearing something, Brassard flashes his light across the room. As the beam scans the wall, it briefly touches on something that moves. Malconus convulsively yanks out his pistol. Look out, it moves! Yells Malconus. Standard knocks his hand down. Keep... Keep away from that gun. <laughs> Standard yells back. Standard shoulders himself in front of the others. Then slowly, he begins to move toward the far side of the room. They approach the console on the wall, training their lights on it. There is a machine. On the machine, a small bar moves steadily back and forth, sliding noiselessly in its screws. Standard says, It's just machinery. Brassard says, But functioning. Malconis looks down at his direction finder. That's where the transmission is coming from. He throws a switch on the direction finder with a crackle and a hum. The unearthly voice fills their earphones. Broussard says, a recording. A damned automatic recording. Alright, I'll just pause that for a sec. <coughs> so, for those who are unfamiliar with the original Alien script and, and the, the vision of the triangle, I've got my own theory on what it actually means. Uh, I think it means Delta, which has something to do with a certain constellation in the sky where uh, the whole story of um, the engineers, maybe it's the origin of the engineers or maybe it's where the alien home planet is. But these are just guess guesses, but they're pretty good guesses because there's a lot of mythology and stuff tied into it. So. Uh, if you want to read about that, I'll link it in um, the blog post, that, which I'll have for this uh, analysis of the script. All right, page 27, continuing. Uh, exterior planetoid sunset. Sinister angle on the snark. As we watch, the sunlight turns the color of blood. Then the sun is down, leaving murky, <laughs> murky blackness in its wake. The ring of floodlights on the ship flares into life, feebly combating the darkness and the storm. Interior multi-purpose room. The entire crew is seated around the conference table, watching holographic pictures projected onto a screen. These photos are taken by their data sticks, <laughs> I'm using inverted commas by the way, um, because it's in the script. So when I do that, it's because it's actually in the script. Uh, and in, in brackets it says flashlight cameras so yeah that, that's pretty much like what they, they use in um, Prometheus anyway standard is commenting on the changing slides this is the control room two or three pieces oh sorry two or three pictures click onto the screen in succession showing suits of men standing against banks of machinery. Standard continues. Some details of the control room. A skeleton appears on the screen. The men react with mutters. Standard continues. This is the skeleton. Another view of the skeleton. The transmitting device. The triangle that was cut into the alien's console appears. Standard continues. 
This is a close-up of the triangle we found, scrolled onto the console in front of the skeleton. Standard changes the slide, and the screen goes wide. And that's it. So that's page 27 going onto page 28. He turns off the projector and brings the lights up. Hunter says, Phenomenal. Staggering. Brassard says, We've got to go back and take a lot more pictures. Holograph everything. I just want to pause that for a sec. So it's clear that they have um, hologram technology and they can do 3D renderings of things. And I think in this part here, it's kind of like what they do with the pyramid in Prometheus using the pups, uh, getting a 3D scan of the pyramid. So it's evident that the technology existed in this original script. Anyway, continuing, I'm just like fangirling over here about all the stuff that was used in the prequels because I've, I've loved this original movie and script from like the beginning. So finding out and, and seeing all of these things uh, in the prequels has been a, a dream come true for me. Anyway, I digress. Um, Morcona says, and bring back as much physical evidence as possible too. The rest of the skeleton, so, some of the machinery, written records if there are any. Roby is slumped in his chair. He has said nothing. Standard says, Martin? Roby says, I agree. This is the single most important discovery in history. Standard says, but? Roby says, what can kill it? Brassard says, hell, that thing's been dead for years, maybe hundreds of years. The whole planet's dead. Faust says, the way I figure it, they landed here for repairs or something. They couldn't take off again. Maybe the dust ruined their engines. They set up an SOS beacon, but nobody came, so they died. Roby said, he died. Faust says, what? I just want to pause this for a second again. Um, th this is really interesting because Brassard here has kind of made a rough stab in the dark about how long um, the space jockey has been dead for. Um, dead for years, maybe hundreds of years. So there's not really, there's not that guess of the fossilization. Um, like you see in the original uh, Alien movie, but in, in the script, it's already a skeleton. So like they're only like making slight guesses about how old this dead space jockey is. So I think it's quite interesting that people kind of use um, the whole fossilization of the space jockey as an excuse as to why the engineers and the space jockey aren't the same uh, cast or, or creature. So it's interesting because in the scripts it's, it's not clear. Um, and obviously Dan Bannon, because this is just a rough script, he's said that the, the planet is very small and just a, a lot of other things that uh, weren't, I guess, based on science. Whereas um, a lot of stuff that Ridley Scott does in, in terms of his films is trying to become a bit more realistic in, in some pieces when it comes to science, like the existence of the planet and and other things like that, the atmosphere and, and so forth, at least in the prequels now anyway. And I think I think he was pretty consistent in um, in the original Alien movie as well. All right, continuing. Uh, this is page twenty nine. Roby says, "Not they, he." They all turn to look in in the direction of Roby's nod. The camera moves over to reveal the alien skull sitting on the table. Roby continued, there was only one skeleton. There is a moment of silence. Uh, by the way, so uh, Roby has brought um, the skull back to the ship, which is something that Shaw does in Prometheus. So yeah, um, in obviously in Prometheus there were more than one body. Uh, but at least in this script here, 
there's only the single space jockey and they've got the evidence which is the the head jay says how's it coming on the repairs faust says well i'm going to have to blow the engines out standard replies and when will you be ready to do that faust says oh i'm not near ready yet standard replies then why the hell are you standing around here <laughs> faust replies right uh, <laughs> you can really tell who Brett and Parker are, um, even without me mentioning their names. Uh, and Kane as well. The men rise and begin to disperse, but Roby remains seated, deep in thought, staring at the skull. Malconus lingers in the room with him. Malconus says, and, there's, and there sits man's first contact with intelligent life in the universe. Exterior ship night. Angle on the ship. Its spotlights are cutting into the gloom. Interior engine room. A room throbbing with power, enormous pulsing engines capable of releasing unima unimaginable energies. I think that's kind of like saying what's going to happen with the um, blowing up the ship at the end. In, anyway, so this is uh, page 30, and I think we'll stop here after I finish reading this, and we'll, we'll talk about what's been happening. <laughs> Hi, by Santa Crux. Thank you for joining. Uh, Faust has a complicated arrangement set up at the base of one of the engines with spotlights on it. He is wearing goggles and thin gloves. Faust says... You ready up there? Interior bridge night. Brassard and Malconis are seated at their consoles, conversing with Faust while they watch their instruments. Brassard says, sure, we're ready. Interior engine room. Faust says, okay, I'm going to start the extraction procedure now. He pauses to wipe his brow. Interior multi-purpose room. Roby is alone in the room, slumped into the chair, watching his photo, watching the photogenic slides on the screen. He is clicking slowly through them. He stops on an angle of a skeleton and stares at it. The alien's misshapen skull is sitting on the table next to him. He picks it up and holds it up to the screen for comparisons and studies it. Standard appears in the doorway. Standard says, Alas, poor Yorick. Roby starts, puts down the skull. Standard sits at the table. Standard continues, nodding at the screen. Find anything we missed? Roby replies and shrugs. I don't even know what I'm looking for. All right, we'll stop there. So that's page 30. Um, I just want to talk about what happened on this page. We've got Roby alone in the chair and looking at photographic slides on the screen, which is pretty much exactly what Elizabeth Shaw is doing. She's reviewing the footage of um, the space jockey being terminated when the uh, door comes down. And is wondering what happened and to kill uh, the engineers. Uh, and it's really interesting standard quoting alas poor Yorick because we we also know that uh, this is a very loose sort of um, relation to uh, some Shakespeare in this um, alien script which is something that Ridley has brought back in um, Covenant, uh, at least in the flute scene, um, in regards to Hamlet. Um, alas, poor Yorick. Which Shakespearean play was that from? I can't even remember. I'm going to have to look it up. All right. So since we're pausing that, 
I'm just going to have a swig of my um, martini, <laughs> espresso martini. Maybe I'll move it to this side. It's from Hamlet. <laughs> wow, that's cool. Um, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most e excellent fancy. He hath borne, borne me on his back a thousand times, and now aboard in my imagination. It is. My gorge rises at it. Wow. So... <laughs> What's interesting, okay, so that's really cool. In in Alien Covenant, in the flute scene, for people who don't know, uh, it's a scene from Hamlet where um, uh, his friends basically try to find out what's wrong with him because they think he's gone a bit mad and he knows that they're trying to trick him into giving out what um, what they have planned secretly. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's really cool that, um, <laughs> that they included it. So it's something from the original Alien script. It's very, very flimsy at best, um, little joke. Because, like, who, everyone does this. They, they see a skull and they go, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him well. Um, and it's an incorrect quote because that's not the original quote that happens in Hamlet. It's that they say it in their own version. And David says the whole Hamlet scene with the recorder scene in his own version to Walter. And, and Walter doesn't know any better. And everyone else doesn't know any better when you're quoting Hamlet. So I think it's, that's kind of a cool little, um, <laughs> little thing that they, they had in there. I'm just nerding out over this script. Uh, I know I'm, I'm covering it slowly with you guys, and I've, I've read this alien script a ton of times. Um, but being able to read it again and experience it with you, yes, <laughs> I know better. <laughs> that's, what, uh, that's what David says. <sighs> so, yeah. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's just weird. But I will include that whole uh, quote for um, Hamlet as well inside the blog post because that will be, yeah, that will be informative. <sighs> um, sorry about the sound issues I was having earlier when I was reviewing um, Alien Containment. I don't know what was happening. That always happens to me in regards to technology misbehaving. So, uh, yeah, what can I do? I apologize. I'm sorry. Um, and by the way, I'm sporting my uh, special um, covenant pin uh, that I've made. Oh, you missed the review. <laughs> it's okay. I've recorded it. But if you want, I can do it again because the the volume didn't work <sighs> but um yeah let's watch it again i may as well i mean like this is just saturday night fun time with mother <laughs> hello gian welcome okay cool so Let's do a review of Alien Containment. Um, I might pause stuff. Oh no, I can't because of the way I'm going to be playing it. But we can talk about it later on um, after the video is played. So, <coughs> all right, let's go ahead. Yeah, 
PGR. Feel free to ask any questions you want. I really like this reveal of the planet. Yes, it's my little Niamo. That's from my friend Ju. My friend Ju really loves alien movies, but our taste is completely opposite. She is more of an alien, alien girl. Yes, Gian, I'm a very fast typer. I've got a, a, a mechanical keyboard, so it'll be too loud to, uh, to type right now. Colonial transfer vehicle Burrowdale. Souls on board. 23,282. Ooh. I really love how the little shuttle comes out after the ship starts to break up. And the explosions are pretty easy as well. And I really like how the wing symbol. It's souls on board. I guess it doesn't include androids. shuttle that needed to dock for repairs and there could have been an infection on there. Plus you've got to understand that Weyland Yutani may have acquired the specimen after the Nostromo destruct. stress the sky shows in this part and I like the detail of the pin on the lapel I like the mission patch for the Burrowdale as well no, I, was, I, was I like that out. in every scene you've got I, uh, um, a console and lights I woke up on the escape deck oh Gian I don't know how many words I can type um, per minute we I just type fastish and I don't even like use proper figures says what time sure. it's set. It's, I think it says 2083. It has a I'll have to go back and check. I will go back and check for you. Either way, it's not canon, so it can no. really take place. It, it just not us. the first movie, so it can take place anytime between Alien and Alien. Those fuckers had something, and it broke out. It this doesn't is make my sense. assumption. This is actually break before the Nostromo actually. We had to try and reestablish containment because they've already got specimens. They blew it up. So yeah, so none of these shorts are canon. They are just a fanciful look into the alien universe. You didn't have a choice. They're created spread remarkably fast. Um, by uh, directors from Tongle. They're not a studio. So even though this is a studio sanctioned um, exercise, it's not official. He's but they were allowed to use a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, assets and stuff like that. Yeah, that guy's a really good actor. We have to kill him. I really like the names as well. Nass, Albrecht, Mills. What are you doing? Very Z 
seen in Warfly. Let's do that. We think it affects memory. Well, I better keep my eye on you as well. Stop! We're not gonna keep you. Stop! Ah. You just see what I saw. See, I know how to smoke. <laughs> <laughs> so you won't stand to it. Ah. Ah. chest person like it's a mouse or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So human stupidity and curiosity, right? Um, they're totally gonna open the door. I watched Mr. H's review uh, Mr. H reviews video reaction of this earlier and he didn't wait till this part he missed out but I really like the the change of comedy in this Mills wakes up he's like holy fuck yes that was great That was fantastic. I really loved it. Sorry if I'm getting a bit red. I'm getting a bit drunk from drinking my um, espresso martini my husband made for me. <laughs> I, I think that's kind of what Alien needs. I love that people want it to be serious all the time, but the little bits of comedy in Alien, I think, really make it. Um, 
it makes it really enjoyable. And I think when we start to make things too serious, then it starts to get a bit boring. I think I'm a bit like Dominic Hailstone in that way, that there's got to be a little bit of comedy to balance it out. And I feel like Covenant had enough of it. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, what do you guys think about um, the original Alien scripts? We, we covered pages 11 to 30 tonight, and we found out things like the the use of the urns which was used in prometheus we found out about uh the fact that uh, lv46 or whatever the planetoid is in this script they could just walk onto the planet with just face masks but then later on they, they talk about having helmets so there's a plot inconsistency there we've got um the data sticks which are this weird drawing by i think either I think it's Ron Cobb, because I don't think Dan O'Bannon could draw like that. Yeah, story about that. So, so I'm, I'm acquaintances or friends with Job Willens who made that that comedy trailer for Alien. So I asked him last Alien Day, "What are you doing for Alien Day? I really want you to make something." I said, um, "I want you to make something about." What did I say? I said I wanted I wanted him to make something about um, a, a summary of like the cast that have died in the past and stuff like that, and um, and he said, oh, I, I'll do that, but I want to put a little twist on it. And I was like, look, I completely trust what you're gonna do, so just do it. <laughs> and he made that alien in memoriam, and I absolutely pissed myself laughing. <laughs> It was so good. I did not expect it to be that good. Um, yeah, it was a pleasant surprise. So, so yeah, it's really cool. Like knowing people in the fan community and then uh, creating cool stuff like that. It was just a lot of fun. So I asked, <laughs> I asked Job this year. Oh, uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to? Um, make a supercut of all of the alien films and he's like nah <laughs> he's already made a cut of um uh, a movie called ripley which is i think alien and uh prometheus or was it alien and aliens by the way he's he's made quite a few different fan edits which are available from directly from him if you follow him on twitter is job willens um, i can include a link in the post as well but he's got a couple of his fan edits up and available if you want to watch them what i really like about the edits are he he edits um prometheus and covenant in parallels so you end up noticing scenes that are very similar to each other which you may not have linked originally and even though I'm really all about parallelism and stuff like that in the Alien films, he was actually able to um, draw some parallels that I didn't even think about. Like even like Corinne. Is it Corinne or was it Faris? No, it was Faris. Faris walking out of the, the Covenant um, dropship on fire and then uh, Charlie being flamed by Vickers in Prometheus. And having the two scenes play side by side, that was, it was full on. So he's a really great um, video editor being able to elicit emotion that way. So I thoroughly recommend um, his uh, Alien Covenant slash Prometheus edit. So yeah. Um, yeah, do you have any questions about anything? Um, there was some news uh, that came out about um, the Alien TV series, which was shared by Hybrid News Network, uh, which they finally were able to reveal some details. So there's been some rumours about Ridley Scott working on the second Alien Covenant film, which I do not know, like, because we're taking information from someone who got info secondhand. Uh, to me, it wasn't direct, so I have no idea whether um, 
Ridley is actually working on the film. As far as I know, uh, of all the people who work on uh, the Alien films, no one has told me that they're working on anything like that or anything could possibly be that. So so there's no, no guarantee. So I'm not going to believe uh, a news report telling me that um, the Alien Covenant 2 is in production um, unless I hear it from someone who's actually working on it. Because you just never know these days. There's a lot of sites that are a bit um, clickbaity. And I'm not saying that uh, H&E is because they've got their, their own sources in regards to that TV series. And I, I don't have sources in regards to the TV series. So I had to just trust what they, they got from their informant. But in regards to the film, um, no, I've had no news whatsoever. And, and, and usually people are, are pretty excited and tell me about stuff. Like, um, I, I know about the Titan book that is coming out that Dane's working on. So, so yeah, like, I'm just going to type uh, this in. So yeah, um, yeah. I don't know what to think about the the TV series. It would be really cool if they actually did that, um, but I really doubt that that would be the case. That there's a TV series uh, coming out or a movie in production. I don't think it's happening, to be honest. Yeah. So Dane's working on another Alien book that hasn't been announced yet. But I am purely guessing that it's going to be something like um, files that Ash has got from Wayland Utani. So it's going to be kind of like the Wayland Utani report, but not. Um, yeah. So so that's um, what. That, so that's what I'm guessing is going to come out. So yeah, he shared that poster, and there's been a couple of other pieces of work. I've seen that are going to be in this up, up and coming book that is unannounced, which I haven't been able to talk about. Uh, so yeah, so there's some new stuff coming out, which will be a lot of fun. And I'm going to be so broke this year in regards to alien stuff. Um, so yeah, it'll be sad. I, I'm going to be very, very broke. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's going to be cool. <sighs> so, I think that um, Alien Day this year is going to be good. Like, a lot of people want a film announcement, but the reality of it is there is not going to be a film announcement. I think at best there might be an audiobook coming out because <laughs> Dirk Mags said that there may be an Alien um, audio uh, audio coming out soon. He mentioned on Twitter. And then there's all of these books and all of these comics coming out. It's going to be a really good year if you are into EU stuff. That's all I can say. And I think if you, if, no, I don't want to say if you're a real alien fan, because I really hate that sort of mindset. If you're really desperate for more alien stuff, <laughs> then you should check out the EU because there's been a lot of really great comics that are coming out. There's a lot of great books coming out. Uh, Alien Echo is due out in April. Yeah, there's just a whole ton of stuff. And and you're missing out. You're missing out a lot of talent and a lot of people who want to make their own contributions to the Alien universe. So these Tongle films are, in a way, just an expression of fans who want to contribute to the Alien universe. And yeah, they're not canon, but they're, they're fun. Sorry. And it kind of displays uh, the sort of talent that's out there in regards to uh, directors, actors, uh, prop makers, costume makers, uh, stuff like that. So VFX. <laughs> so yeah, um, I think that you should treat yourself and, and get into um, the, the comics and the books. Anyway, 
I've, uh, I may as well do the Patreon draw right now. Just a little bit drunk. <laughs> but, um, this is for Aliens Resistance, which I've got signed by T-Rex Jones. And, and for those people who don't know, um, T-Rex is Tristan Jones, who did the alternate cover for Aliens Resistance, and he did the character design and artwork for Aliens Defiance, and he lives in Melbourne, so I, I visit him at work, and he talks Alien with me, which I really love, I really love talking about Alien with him, because we think a lot alike, except for the fact he likes AVPR, but, you know, I'll forgive him. So, so yeah, we're going to do the Patreon draw. So just give me a sec while I bring up my patrons for the month. We've had um, Tim Kulin join the Patreon, which is really awesome. Thank you, Tim. Just drink more. I really love espresso martinis and I really love my husband for making it for me. <laughs> He's a good egg. Okay. Uh... I hope that's my password because I couldn't remember. Give me one sec, I will be right back. So I had to put it on charge, that's why I didn't have it on me. <sighs> Alright. Bloody hell. Cool. There we go. So now I'm at 11 patrons a month and I'm making 57 bucks, which covers all of the costs of the all of the costs of the running the blog and the podcasts and the subscriptions. Yeah. And also we're, we're paying for um, a translation of the Japanese Prometheus novel which I think I'll make public um, eventually, but everyone on Patreon will get first dibs on what it's about. Okay. Uh, I think this is it. All right. So thank you to all of my patrons. Uh, we've got Benjamin Scottford, Daniel Cooper, uh, Georgina Gray, JB, Lady Anne, Michael Andrews, Noah Howard, uh, P. Wayland, uh, Project Acheron, or Asheron, as I should say, uh, Sarah Hall, uh, Shell Fort, Tim Kulin, Zeno Park, and Zachary Rice. Uh, thank you for your support. Because of you, I'm able to do all the fun things that I do for the alien community um, without going completely broke. Because <laughs> I, I roughly spend about $100 a month on the alien community. Which is like, that's not a big thing for me. I get about $100 a week in pocket money. Um, and I love giving. I'm all about giving to people like feel like we make Earth a better place when we do things like that. Anyway, let's go to the downloads and see this file. So, I'm just going to do the Patreon draw, and we only do the draw for people who are current donators, so people who have a deference for that month 
or something like that, unfortunately, you won't be eligible for the draw. And we're only taking people who are sponsoring us with $5 or more because postage has gone up in Australia, which totally sucks. But that's just the way it is. All right. So. All right. So it's going to be a draw between these people. Just give me a sec while I uh, sort out who is eligible and who isn't. So let me go to the name, random name picker. So in this draw, we've got Benjamin Scottford, Michael Andrews, Sarah Hall, Tim Kulin, Daniel Cooper, Project Acheron, Zachary Rice, Noah Howard, and Sean Hewitt for Aliens Resistance. One more drum roll, and I'm just going to have a swig of this. Clicking on random name picker right now. And the winner is, oh, it's the same winner as last month. <laughs> so I can't, I'm going to have to pick again. Okay. Sorry. One more time. And the winner is. Zachary Rice. Ooh, Zachary wins. Yay. So I'll send that out to you, Zachary, um, when the post office is open again on Monday. Congratulations on winning your prize. So as you guys know, I better print this out so I remember. Excuse me, just burping. <laughs> Ladylike, not. So, next month is April. And in April, we have Alien Day. And as you know, on Alien Day, I do giveaways. So, I've got a couple of pins left. There's actually more than a couple. Um, and there's going to be ones that aren't perfect where the color has gone a bit discolored or it's been a bit chipped or a bit weird shaped i will be giving those away to people um but here's the catch you have to subscribe not subscribe sorry subscribe means that you're actually paying me money but you have to follow me on twitch that's the rules um so if you're a twitch follower i'll be doing a giveaway on alien day and you'll have a chance to win a not so fabulous uh Wayla yutani pin <laughs> and i'll mail it out to you so stay tuned for that uh apart from that there'll be other um, giveaways and prizes i've uh, i've ordered um one of these uh, special 40th anniversary alien pops which is this one um, so yeah it'll be it'll be good for you to 
um, follow my channel. I would appreciate any subscriptions on Twitch, actually. Uh, if you are on Patreon and you want to subscribe to Twitch, you can just choose to subscribe the difference. So on Patreon, if you're subscribed to the $10 tier, you subscribe on, um, what is it? On, uh, on Twitch, you can subscribe the difference on Patreon and you'll still be eligible for prizes and stuff like that. I'll make sure that you're still involved. So, yes, here we go. Zachary Rice, your prize. I've printed out your name. If anyone wonders whether it's rigged, it is not. That's his name. He won. So. <laughs> Is that <sighs> so yeah okay <laughs> thanks for the compliments guys <laughs> compliments I run on them um yeah uh yeah the pins are really cool I really love them they just look so good uh you probably can't see it that well in this sort of light but this is the rainbow pin maybe you can see it if i hold it up closer do, 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 do. so shiny so pretty um yeah our, our, our community member or and um one of our mods uh franz hatting uh, who's currently taking a break from facebook for his uh, mental health uh he helped me do up um, a file for that and I, I sent it off to a factory to get made so that's how that these were made originally I was going to hand make them but making them out of silver and gold is actually very expensive so I do not recommend it uh, but if you want one made out of silver and gold I'm more than happy to make one for you um, but they will be handmade and they take time so they'll be a damn sight more expensive then uh, how much it costs for these to get made. So, so currently I'm, I'm selling these for 20 Australian dollars. So if you're overseas, that will actually work out quite cheap. And that includes postage. So originally I had them at, at 35, but now I'm just trying to get rid of the remainder. So it's at 20. So if you'd like to get one uh, before Alien Day, which is in perfecto mint condition, not chipped, full color and stuff like that, then you've got to buy one. Otherwise, you'll have to uh, have to roll the dice on Alien Day and hope you get one that isn't so effed up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, for those people who aren't on the Utani Discord, uh, I would love for you to join. Like I, I know I'm not there that often. I wish I could be, um, but having sorts of discussions and stuff like that with everyone I really enjoy them so I think that yeah I think that you should totally join up and enjoy uh, the sorts of conversations that we can have and also enjoy the bot that I have that I've programmed so if you type exclamation mark I'll, I'll program one now actually you see I use me six spot because I tried to get one written and it was just way too way too complicated programming it myself every single time but I'm gonna program alien containment so it plays the short um, Thank you for following me, Rotaku, aka Kupa. <laughs> I see you subscribe now. That's great. Um, it's just easier because I do all of my streams now, um, and it's frustrating that I guess. 
Hold on a sec. Um, I can't do podcasts anymore because I've got the kids doing live streams. And it's a bit more laid back, a bit easier. I don't have to worry about editing because it can take ages for editing to happen, um, especially when I've got the kids in tow during the week. So. So yeah, it, um, it definitely makes a difference. All right, just give me one second. It's not going to work. My internet keeps dropping out. I know that the streaming is working, but I can't do uh, that sort of stuff. <laughs> oh, you appreciate our channel on Discord the other day. Yeah, uh, originally I wasn't open to listening to other people's ideas. Um, that's another thing I, I really want to be honest. I was, I've never, haven't always been an ideal alien fan. Um, there was someone who tried to introduce ideas to me and I was like fully against it because it just went against every grain of my being to even acknowledge it. And then later on I found out that that was the case that the director had intentionally made something a certain way and that was the inspiration and I felt a very sheepish after that I was like look and I just apologized to the guy I'm so sorry you were trying to tell me this uh theory and I wasn't willing to listen and I feel like an idiot now because that was what the director's original intent was so from now on I actually try to um listen to people about what they they think and what they say because you you never know <laughs> you can't you can't go around life thinking that you're you're the only one that's right and um and this person like yeah it just <laughs> his his theory pissed me off so much um that i it got visibly angry and upset and i couldn't even look at the screen so <laughs> i'm not perfect but um but yeah it was a learning experience and and now I'm humbled by anyone who's willing to share uh, their point of view on the Alien franchise and, and what they think because you just never know. <laughs> you just never know that they might be hitting the nail on the head and you might be completely wrong. So, yeah. I really appreciate everyone's input. I really like having this sort of discussion and uh, evoking that sort of feeling of like connection with fellow fans so it's cool I'm getting really red now I'm getting really drunk so like if you want to ask any questions right now is the time because <laughs> I will not hold back yeah so it's it's hard when fans can be really um, really oh what's the word dissonant I don't know I don't know but really when sharing their um, opinions and uh, uh, there's there's a group of people now who think vastly different from me but they're, they're close friends and I really appreciate their point of view even though they totally hate Covenant in the prequels I really respect uh, their ideas and their theories and, and, and their view of the fandom and, and what they contribute to it because they're, they're so clued in and smart and probably know as much if not more than me um they're very accepting of other people's opinions as well <laughs> despite despite hating all of the things that i absolutely love and and fangirl about so so yeah it's uh it's an eye opener um like originally i wouldn't even i wouldn't even be able to imagine that i would be friends with people who thinks so differently from me, but I think it's refreshing. I think it's important to surround yourself 
for people with different opinions and not let yourself live in an echo chamber of the same opinions because I, f I feel like with social media these days we kind of fall into that like there's people who are like right leaning or left leaning everything's like very political and if you don't think the same you just block people and I don't think that's right because when we live in a world where other people have different opinions and you have to learn to get along with them whether you like it or not so I try to keep um, friendships with people who think completely different from me because they need to be also exposed to people with different ideas and they shouldn't live in an echo chamber either so if you if they tolerate me I tolerate them <laughs> uh, one of the hardest things that I had to do was unfriend an alien fan who was noticeably a Nazi uh, because being their friend all of that stuff came up on my feed and even though what they were debating and, and talking about were um, unfairness towards white people in comparison to people of color and they weren't calling for like genocide or anything like that they were just saying you know like it's a double standard in, in regards to the way that people talk and this is how uh, social media sites address it and they were right they were right they were they were treated um, badly and inconsistently but in comparison to what people of color have to put up with it's nothing it's really <laughs> I couldn't be their friend anymore so I just had to explain to them you can follow my Utani page and follow my alien stuff but I could not be friends with you on Facebook because you're a Nazi <laughs> and I'm a person of color and and whether whether you condone the genocide of my people or not it's just not something I can agree with so I had to draw the line somewhere Bystander Crux says, I try to be tactful talking about my ideas, but I know that sometimes it doesn't cross, come across that way. That's the hardest for me. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's a learned skill to be able to converse with people without being abrasive. For me, in, in my case, I can be a total bitch to people if I want to. I, it's completely within my power. I used to be teased at school and I've been treated like shit and I know how to treat people like shit in return and it's, it's a conscious decision not to do that. So if I'm being nice to you, it's because I'm choosing to. <laughs> yeah, some people can't take uh, different opinions. Um, I think if you're like I'm, I'm pretty tactless when it comes to uh, my opinions sometimes and people take that as me being a bitch that's why I just own the fact that I'm a bitch people are just gonna have to deal with it <laughs> that's that's the way mother is you bitch I turned off the, the counter the, the cooling unit mother anyway <laughs> um, so yeah it's some people need to be approached in a certain way. They're very fragile. <laughs> so you have to be careful about the way you talk to them so they don't get hurt or offended. And that's fine. People demand a certain amount of uh, respect when you come towards them. And you have to come either crawling on your knees or with your arms down and in a non-confronting way for them to be able, sorry, to be able to engage with you. <laughs> Your uh, by Santa Crux says, my passion is often misinterpreted as close-minded. Yeah, same here. <laughs> you say I'm far from a bitch, you have no idea. <laughs> uh, I can be pretty cruel, um, but I, I choose to be kind to people. I think I think my bitchiness comes out usually when my friends get attacked so it's not so much me I can take a lot of shit from people I, I worked 
16 years in customer service and I've had people say the most awful things to me. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of used to abuse, so I can deal with it. But when people attack my friends, I get really protective and I draw the line there. Uh, Lunar Otaku 7 says, Luckily, Nazi is where you draw the line, apparently. Lol. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, uh, if you've noticed, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you might notice that some of my uh, friends from the alien community are, are really dead set against gay and trans people. And, you know, that's their opinion. That's fine. Um, but I'm not. I, I'm openly bisexual. And um, I, I have no problem with trans people because I am a person for transhumanism. I don't think the, the human body should matter if I can and, and if I can and will in the future. I want to be able to transfer myself into a robotic body. So gender won't matter. So all of these like fights about um, gender and stuff like that. Apples, oranges, it's, <laughs> it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, all, all that matters is this. And, and that comes um, into the same realm of um, attraction to people as well. So I'm attracted to people's minds, not their bodies. And people go, oh yeah, whatever. Um, but it's true. It doesn't really matter what you look like. If you have a beautiful mind and you interact with people the right way, I will be attracted to you. <laughs> Um, today I'm wearing my uh, Prometheus ring, which is the one that I modelled after um, Elizabeth Shaw's ring. I don't know whether you'll be able to see that detail, but there's engraving on the bottom of it, uh, which is in um, uh, Elizabeth Shaw's ring, which is Holloway's ring. But um, the guy who engraved it, he engraved on the front, he engraved AC, which is actually on the back of the ring on Prometheus and it's flat on the front. Uh, so if you want to get one of these rings made, just let me know and I'll get one made for you. But they cost me about $80 to cast in silver and then there's postage on top of that. And if you want a box, it's going to be extra. So, so yeah, if you want to be fancy and get an Elizabeth Shaw slash Charlie Holloway ring from Prometheus. I can make one. <laughs> yeah, let's all be robots together. Let's all ditch our gender roles and become data. <laughs> I'd love it. Um, I think it, the world would be a better place if everyone could just uh, see facts for facts and data for data and not be swayed by human emotion i feel like life and earth would be better that way <laughs> if that sounds weird i'm sorry but uh that's just the way i think me being mother i want to dust off this uh human existence and get into my robot body it's quick smart because once we are robot and this is coming from me um assuming that <laughs> I sound like David. Thank you. I take that as a compliment. Um, once we're robot, we won't have to worry about the effects of being outside of the Earth's atmosphere in space. So we don't have to worry about radiation or exposure or x-rays or anything that can limit the life of the human body. Uh, we would be able to travel beyond uh, our solar system. Time would only be a concept because we would live forever so we could travel forever and we would have to especially if we get FTL because we need something faster than FTL to be able to travel to the end of um, the universe because the universe is constantly expanding so so yeah that's my thoughts on it I, I if you want to be become an interstellar traveler with me <laughs> and be stuck on a ship with me in my robot body and in your robot body um, yeah <laughs> sign up <laughs> i'd love to be your um infinite universe partner in go exploring in space i think that would be really cool the first thing that i want to do is actually go to zeta to uh to reticuli uh which may or may not have a planet but the binary star system that would be really cool just to say that i've been there and you know 
from um, an alien fan's point of view. I don't know whether that sort of thing would matter to me anymore once I'm a robot because your priorities change once you uh, disconnect from um, human wants and desires. So, yeah. <laughs> Bystander Crux says, as long as we have alien movies on our ship. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> if I can, I will abduct Michael Fassbender and he will have to act in, in the in the role of David for the entire time we're on the ship. <laughs> or I'll, I'll have a robot body made for him. Um, but yeah. <laughs> That's what, what my alien fantasy will entail. And um, there'll be a whole bunch of other sci-fi movies that we can watch. I think we'll have like a whole backlog because the way that... Uh, digital data storage is really good now you can store a massive amount on a very small uh small uh space of uh computer chip so i think we'd be able to have the entire backlog of information and and media from humanity along with us so that'll be interesting and i want to be able to study uh genetics while we're out there as well but we would have to find a way to um <laughs> but standard crux says and david can watch my dreams all he wants yeah uh oh, you know what? once we're robots we won't be able to dream at least in the alien universe you wouldn't be able to that's that's what ash marvels at in the alien novel which i will cover after the original alien script and, and the different variations of it but yeah that's something to think about <laughs> Um, so yeah, I've got to finish the rest of my martini. So, so it's five minutes past midnight now and I have to go to sleep soon. I'm, I'm holding, a, an art giveaway at my studio. So for those people who don't know this year, I purchased a business, which is a co-working artist space and studio. And this is kind of like a, a realization of this sort of passion I've had with Utani, um, helping and supporting local artists. So in the, sorry, by Santa Cruz says David dreams though. Yeah, he says he dreams, but I think he, it's, it's a play on words in regards to, um, to Lawrence of Arabia that um, men who dream with open eyes are, to be feared and he is a man or something that looks like a man who dreams with open eyes and his dreams are actually nightmares uh and he can make his dreams come true sort of thing so yeah i think i think that uh david's dreams are actually his programming from wayland anyway that's another theory for another time um but but yeah, this, this studio is a, a realization of, of my passion with Utani and, and wanting artists to get recognition for the work that they do. So I, I bought a studio in Fitzroy and now I'm helping and supporting local artists achieve their dreams. So tomorrow we're clearing out a, an, a loft area, which is above Studio 5, where there's just a, a ton of... Um, canvases and paintings uh, that artists have left in previous years so I'm since I've taken over this business I'm clearing the place out and so there's 10 years of accumulated art that's in storage and um, I've put out a uh, invitation on reddit <laughs> and on facebook and we've had a ton of interest of um, people coming down and and helping us clear out this art and, and take some art home with them. And I've asked people for a gold coin donation to go towards our community projects. So that'll be really cool. So um, it's a really big thing for me to try to balance Utani and balance Call Creative Studios because one is my real life job and I have to make it monetarily work. And, and Utani is a, um, a fandom passion project and I have to monetarily make that work too through Patreon so that's through community contributions and through Claw Creative that's through the artists themselves uh, renting a space within my studio so yeah it's um 
it's a big thing to try to balance the two things. Uh, so yeah, if you have any more questions before I finish the rest of my martini, go ahead. Getting a bit lightheaded now because of the martini. I'm just going to check my messages and see what's going on. So, for people who don't know, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Patreon, SoundCloud, YouTube, Reddit, and WordPress. <laughs> just daydreaming about David yeah I daydream about David a lot <laughs> the, the funny thing is like when people I guess dream about David it's it's because of his physical being as Michael Fassbender and embodying the character and stuff like that and as as attractive as Michael Fassbender is it's, it's not the appeal to me the appeal to me is his mind so what he thinks of the human race, what he thinks of our origins, why he decides to create the alien, all of that sort of stuff is just... So... <laughs> it's, um, it's very sexy. I love it. <laughs> I think for the next alien movie, I really want to see a female android. I want to see what... Um, Ridley Scott's depiction would be because all we have is Cole and I love Cole um, she's great but I would like to see what Ridley Scott would do to have a female android and how she would act because obvi obviously with Cole she's got her own autonomy she's exactly like David but she chooses to do good things because of her programming because she's she can't harm anyone but I wonder would this female robot be like Walter, like really wound back, no emotion? Or uh, would she have emotion because she that's what she's made for? Would she be a, like a companion robot uh, where people could impress their emotions on her? Would she be a caregiver, like taking care of the colony's children and stuff like that? I think it would be an interesting concept to visit. All right, I'm nearly done drinking. Yes, Ridley does have a great reverence for children. Uh, sorry, for women. I nearly said children. <laughs> I'm a bit drunk. Um, for women, um, because of the way he portrays them in his films. I think he doubled down on the fact that Ripley was a woman, but originally he wasn't bothered either way. Uh, Luna Otaku says, are you looking forward to Raised by Wolves? Yes! Oh my god, I'm so excited! Um, it's, it's, it's a dream come true. If he doesn't end up making Covenant, I'm just going to fantasize about this being the sequel. <laughs> um, he's only directing two episodes. Two. The first one and the second one, and then that's it. After, or maybe it was three? But then after that, it'll be other directors. And then he'll be, I think he'll be producing. So it's, it's not going to, he's not going to be directing the entire series because that's not the way TV series work. They, they swap around uh, directors and writers all the time to keep their episodes fresh and different and without falling into like tropes or patterns where the viewer ends up being completely bored about what's happening on the screen, which I think is a good thing. So after he's done Raised by Wolves, I think he's doing Merlin. Well, actually, he's doing Merlin currently. I'm not sure. He was spotted in a city and he was filming at a castle, which was in the UK. And I don't know whether it's it was one of his... I know he was supposed to do the Battle of Great Britain or something, or maybe that project fell through. So I don't know whether he was filming that. But he was already filming something in a castle 
he was seen months ago doing that, so I don't know what's going on with that. But I know he's doing all of Merlin for Disney, and I think it's definitely because he wants to get on their good side. Lunar Otaku 7 says, I remember reading he was only doing two. Yeah, I think two as well. Bystander Crux says, Raised by Wolves seems to be a clue that Covenant sequel won't happen though. Yeah, I... It was mentioned that Ridley Scott is working on an alien thing. Whether it's a sequel for Covenant or not stands to be seen. Lunar Otaku says, I heard they casted or something for Merlin that they have the characters written out. So yeah, so if they're at casting, that, that, that means they're really close to filming. So maybe it was Battle of Great Britain or something that he was filming at that castle. Um, in regards to Covenant and a sequel, as far as I know, the last time Ridley Scott spoke about Covenant 2, it was actually, he said it took place between Prometheus and Covenant. So it's actually a prequel to Covenant. It's not Covenant 2 as in a sequel to where the Covenant is going. So if he goes with his original plan, which we all know that Ridley Scott changes his mind um, willingly whenever he feels like it, uh, it may be the prequel to Alien Covenant, which I'm totally up for as well because I want to see what happened with Shaw and David and how he descended into madness and how Shaw died. <sighs> Lunar Otaku says, I'm still holding out that deadline report where they said Disney, sorry, deadline report where they said that Scott Free will likely stay on with Disney. Uh, which is interesting because Scott Free is a production company. So, yeah. <laughs> what else? Her bystander Crux says, but in that same report, they said they will be doing Alien first and then Merlin. So, yeah. I don't know about that, to be honest, because um, we both know that pre-production and production and post-production take a very long time. So if Ridley Scott is doing something, like, I, I can imagine that uh, the Covenant prequel, so Covenant 2, if it is a Covenant prequel, they would be able to finish it in a very short time because you've got Numi Rapace, you've got Michael Fassbender, and then you've got the Derelict, and that's the setting. Then you've got some scenes which will be set at Planet 4, which is once they arrive, and even then the sets can be quite small. And as far as I know, they recre recreated the set for David's lab for a convention. So it would be a very small budget that they would be able to stick to if it was a David and Shaw film. So I'm, I'm hoping it's that. They would definitely be able to complete that before Melon. Um, and then Bias Santa Crux says, and since they're doing Melon already, that discredits the report. Yeah. So that's the thing about secondhand information. They're going by what they read in the media as well. They may not be directly informed by Ridley Scott and his projects. And everyone who works on a film signs an NDA and they can be sued to hell if they leak anything at all. So it's really hard to f get concrete information in regards to features and films and stuff like that that's coming out and you only find out about it through concept artists and pre-production people which i i have some connections with so only some people in the industry and that's if they are willing to share information with me and that's if i can share information with you because i get to see stuff and then i'm not allowed to talk about it because i don't want to get them in trouble so yeah same thing all right, this is the last of my martini. If there is uh, 
Anything more to say? Please say it now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> checking my messages one more time before I go um, yeah. um, by Stana Crux just wants to say thank you for the stream <laughs> thank you for joining um, it's really weird when I do this sort of uh, streaming by myself when there's no one watching because I, then I, I have to try to think of stuff to talk about and it's so much more engaging and helpful when there's at least one or two people talking um, while I'm doing the stream. So thank you for joining me. It's, uh, it's now 19 minutes past 12 in Melbourne, Australia. So, yeah, thank you so much for joining me and um, engaging with Studio Utani and, and me, myself, Mother9000. I really appreciate anyone who subscribes to our Twitch channel for uh, keeping in touch with more information. And I'll read more of the Alien scripts, I think, this coming Wednesday. If it's not too busy, it depends on whether I have any appointments at the studio. So, yeah. Thank you for watching. This is Mother9000 signing off. Good night. Bye.